understand though that that bread does not absorb heat properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what and um, and the same for in evaporator saturation temperature. Other, in other words, the TD of these boxes should not exceed 20. When you begin to exceed 20, you're getting into air conditioning range or high temperature range. Uh, air conditioning, the TD is normally about 25 degrees. Mm -hmm. So as you're getting up there, the temperature of your box will be getting hot and hot, and that's an indicator that something is wrong with your um, system. And if it's ice up, guys, there's a simple check. If you look at the coil, you will see ice, and you will see, actually see the ice only. So, uh, what we do is shut down, to melt this out, do not use knife, do not shoot, use tools, do not use a blowtorch, you can use a, um, yeah. You can use a heat gun, but you'll be standing up there all day. Wow. Wow. I don't really use them um, if the box is not fully loaded and there's adequate drain. I normally get a, um, warm water from a, with a hose and spray it on the ice. It melts it up pretty fast. Okay. Um, do not use any sharp implement or a hammer or the torch because I know guys use torch on these. Remember I told you guys about the beacon system that yeah. use all those the electronic door. controls? Mm -hmm. it torches all the way. And they torch for most of the temperature sensors. Brother, right. so, yeah. they, they will, yeah. yeah, the temperature sensor did the resistance temperature type. Mm -hmm. oh, they, they, uh, Lucky for them, I had like four in stock. Okay. So that was my turn to charge them double. There you go. Yeah, if you're stupid, you gotta pay for it. Yeah. You know? Hey, don't right. expect me to regard you for your stupidity. Pay for it. Yeah. That's when you make more money. Yeah. Yeah. Inefficient compressor, high head pressure. Amount of cooling, medium air, water must, uh, is insufficient, condenser discharge air. We talk all about this. Now this is the one, restrictions. Restriction can be partial or full. We did went over this, right? Yeah. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Inefficient compressor. Blow, this is where we're at. That's where we are. Good. This is where we're at. You see, with a compressor, electrical problem, you typically, um, you can find out why a compressor is tripping on overload. For example, I will have a compressor, and normally they have, they have the little cover over the relay overload assembly. And there are times when it's tripping and you take off the cover to check if there's anything that jumps off at you visually, and you may have the compressor running and it stays running. The moment you put the cover back on, it trips. Can you figure out what really is going on there? Something's getting too hot and I'm probably loose. Cover. I'm probably loose. Well, I know the overload is probably getting too hot. Yeah, so maybe it's pumped too many amps. Well, that's where you, you will check your yeah, amperage of your compressor yeah. because that's the first thing you run. Right. If the overload is tripping, yeah. the first thing you check is the amperage amper draw this compressor. Mm -hmm. But let's say my amperage draw is okay. Now I have to find out why it's You're tripping when I put the cover. Air blowing across the compressor or something? Maybe the cover's Maybe in the, the way the of the wire. Maybe the dirty. You know, you know what I found on that system like that? The, um, the overload itself is just Bad. weak. Oh, it's tripping when it shouldn't be? Yeah, it's what we call nuisance trip. Uh, nuisance trip? Yeah. It's a nuisance on us. Yeah, because there's no Nothing symptoms. There's wrong. no symptoms of why it should trip. It's, it's just, just tripping, tripping for no reason at all. You know. Yeah. I mean, not no reason, but it's doing it every five minutes and it's tripping yeah. because it's broken itself. Yes. Yeah. So you know, in a case like that, you change. But normally, 
when I have to change the overload, I also change the relay assembly. Always make those components there to start components or a co compressor. Do not just change one, guys, change the whole assembly. So you have the overload, you have the relay, you may have a start capacitor, or you may have a run capacitor. Change everything in there. Yes. So that way you know that, okay, you know, because if that, once that um, overload was stripping, it means it was short tightening that compressor. That means your relay was also switching on and off each time. And they have, the, the contacts is normally, when the coil and the size, the contacts close. And it depends on spring action to hold it open. Something that springs going to stop. So the spring can get weak because of the heat there. Because every time it opens and closes, it develops more heat. Yeah. And this system may not be staying on long enough to blow enough air to cool it down. So always change your whole thing and thing. But in a case like that, you just, the, we know um, in this case, the overload is just weak and yes. because if the compressor is drawing normal running amps, you're okay. If it's drawing higher than normal amperage, you have to find out why it is drawing higher than normal amperage. But normally with the cover on and off, it wouldn't be a case of higher than normal amperage. It's gonna be a weak overload. So we can do some pumping problem here. Number one, we will have a system with a receiver. We have what they call a king valve. We can front seat that king valve. That stops refrigerant from going to the, the, to the evaporator. So I'm gonna be, the compressor will run now and pull down the low side. And you look at how fast it pulls on, and you know, once you're in the field, you should have a relatively decent idea of the time it takes for one, for a system of whatever size you, you're you working on to pull down after you go into a manual pump dump. Now, uh, once that happens, the compressor will shut off. Um, yeah, you see if the compressor the shuts pressure. off, right? And the low pressure, and you, and if it holds, you know, your compressor valves are okay. But there's a, another test we do. We will jump on the pressure switch, okay? Put the jump across it so it doesn't, right. even yeah. if it goes open, it's gonna keep running. Yeah. And we're gonna pull a vacuum test. Typically go up to about five inches, and you see how long it holds that five inches, and how long it takes to get there, and how long it will hold it. You're, you don't really have to hold, sit down there for five, 10, 15 minutes. The moment that compressor shuts off, when you get to that five, five inches of vacuum, you pull that jumper, compressor shut off. If it stays right there where that needle is, there will be a little movement up because there's still refrigerant in the oil, but should not go up much more than two notches. All right, so it goes from five to about three inches. Right. So once it stays in that region, hey, my compressor is good. Nobody wants to do a, um, take out a compressor to do a bench test. But if you're going to take it out, what you do is hook the suction and discharge, and you hook on gauges, and you just let that compressor run. No refrigerant. <coughs> just let it run. And you check the suction and discharge to see if it's pumping to suit the compressor, um, the what do you call it, the, the ratio, ratio, the compressor ratio. So you just let it go with nothing in it? <coughs> yeah, with nothing in it, just hook the suction and discharge in it, it's a, like a closed loop, you're making. Okay, but no condenser unit, no evaporator unit, no metering device. No, just the pipe. Yeah, well I ain't taking out no compressor to do that, if this ain't, take me there, then, you know, this is good enough for the field. You can do um, the same thing in the field if you if you really have the tools out there to do it. 
And of course, you do a running test in the system, go through, see how it pulls down, see what the uh, pressure difference is. Given that all thing, all other things are working okay. And then you know, but this one more or less takes us. I just do this one in the field, and hey, if that's pointing to a bad compressor, and I know everything else is working okay. Now, this is the last thing in the system I am gonna condemn. I will check every other thing, because this is the most expensive piece of equipment in the system. So I will make sure I go around and check every other thing, even the, the amount of air coming off of the coils, both evaporate and condenser, check the air, make sure they're running. CFO. At the, uh, actually, I don't check the CFM, I check the RPM. They have mm -hmm. a, uh, the motor? They, yes, they have a, a tachometer, you can look at it, just shoot at the blade with, the, with this little, just like that. Yeah, you're and as the blade cut it, it comes from any time that blade cuts that light, and it translates that into RPM. And typically, a condenser RPM is, uh, is 1550. And evaporators about the same thing. 1550 RPM. And a small unit. But a large unit you can get, get a 1800 with two none. Use 2600 RPM on fans and the outdoor unit and the condenser. It's 1800 or 875. Okay, so 1800 will be 1725 RPM. Is 1800 is um, synchronous. So 1725 or 875. That would normally be the condenser fan speed. Because 3600, if one of those fan blades, if a little piece break off from it, it's going to shoot yeah. right into that coil and puncture right through and through, or it might hurt somebody out there. And those fan blades, guys, they have a way. They have the hub that goes onto the shaft and couple on there, and the blade is just pressed onto the hub. And right at that point where you press on, snaps off. It tears, and it can be nasty. Very. Your, if your hand accidentally get in the way of that, you're gonna be crying. crying you're, gonna be, you're gonna be crying from. No, and uh, be bleeding. Mm. Well, that too. <laughs> But you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be crying because you ain't got a hand anymore. <laughs> yes, Miss Palmer. Another <coughs> five yards is just gone. Uh -uh. So, you gotta be, you gotta be um, very careful. I mean, these are moving parts. Those are steel blades. They, they're mechanical. They cannot sense that this thing that's hitting it is flesh. They can't tell if it's flesh, if it's a piece of, if it's a grass blade or what? They don't care. They're designed to go and they're going to go. Always, whenever you go to the field and you take off the guard, the fan guard off of a system, replace it. Yes, always replace it. Because the, the person it hurt may be you. Yes. Um, I do know some tall guys took the fan guard off with the blower units in the walk-in boxes, and they're walking around checking the blower, and bam. <coughs> yeah, because they're tall enough for their head to be on the same level. With me, I'm short. My head hit the bottom of the thing, and it, if that worked, imagine a fan moving at 1,500 RPM. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so, still. So, this here you can do it on a bench, but like I said, nobody, nobody in their right mind is going to go there and take off a compressor. Because you, to take the compressor out of the system, you have to recover the gas. And that is a no no in my book. I am too lazy. I learned to work smart, not hard. When you have valves in the system, you can do that. All right? Do the vacuum test. If it's a pump down system, hey, better yet, you don't have to even touch any valve. Turn the thermostat to the highest temperature, shuts down, it deenergizes solenoid, yeah. 
and it goes into <coughs> automatic pump down, and you will see how it operates. Um, throughout every truck, because sometimes they, um, if you have a solenoid that's leaking, <laughs> it's very hard to determine whether it's a compressor or the solenoid that's blowing back. All right, so kind of difficult, but as you get the experience, guys, you will know which one of these tests you can you can actually do up there. And well, if the solenoid's leaking, would you get frost by it on the other side of it? No, when I see the solenoid is leaking by, right? Yeah. When you shut down. Sometimes it's very, these leaks, um, they're not that heavy, mm -hmm. all right? They just piss by them, okay, like weeping. Right. And you won't find any significant temperature difference. Okay. I mean, the thing is, the temperature difference was already existing there because you were pumping down. Right. And you're sucking the liquid line from there down into below freezing, right. so you do have sweating on that line anyhow. So okay. you know you can pinpoint that and say, hey, yeah, this is leaking. So you need to be able to isolate. So once the system has all of that, you can do that. You see, with these, only the larger system will have service valves. Small baby system, if you suspect a compressor um, is bad then on capillary tube system, you know, I'm not gonna tell you pin job because some, some of these are. Um, yeah, but on cap tube system, you, you probably have to sweat off the lines and put caps on them. Yeah, or, yeah. So, you know, this, uh, it's, anyhow you look at it, unless you have the vibes that can help you out with the situation, you won't be able to um, do much. You have to, you have to create something. <laughs> so, the bench test of compressors is the same thing I was just telling you. Do a, um, do a running bench test compressor by connecting a line from discharge to suction. That's what we call the closed loop. Bench test. No, well, if I, if I close the loop, whatever was in that system, which is air, which is some of the run from the oil, and that's going to pump. But of course, like I said, you're going to put two access valves in that line so you can check suction and discharge. So, so because it is, you will definitely get a discharge uh, different. So, you had, um, Oh, oh, you want to go back? And like with everything else, guys, when you go to the wife said, oh, he's just be organized. You don't have to be there. And then you pull up. And just use, you know, just bring up the tools you need. You don't bring out the service call. That's what I go, when I walk into a place, I usually bring my little meter, I bring a pair of uh, small adjustable pumps or channel locks, what, six and one speed driver? I think you got the wrong tip for my uh, drill. Oh, yes, I do. I have it. It's in my bag. I saved it. All right. I was looking for it the other day. I got it. She said she never said it. Last week. Yeah, that's what she said. Do you remember this? Can 
like, oh, yeah. Like, I said, Bitch, what's going on? I don't know, man. I just Organizing your troubleshooting, and like I just said, my tools are nut drivers, screwdriver, six in one screwdriver, <coughs> small adjustable probably in a water pump pliers, and my electrical tester. Well, my tester has temperature gauges and everything, and I can check temperature on a tube in with a clamp on. Yeah. So I do not need gauges. Your gauges are the last thing I ever came out of my truck. If I got the the case clamp right and it translates that temperature to gauges, that's on your gauge. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you don't have to hook hoses up, right? No. I don't have to. So, so I just put the cake clamps on. Yeah. That's nice. That's beautiful. Nice. Yeah. That would be good for ice machines, right? Because you never want to hook up gauges. Yeah, so, you know, that's the last thing I do. I just check pressures. Yeah. In there, right? So, PD chart, you always need one of those unless you have one of those gauges you have. <laughs> Yeah, hey guys, shut the fuck up, man. That's what I'm talking about, man. Hey, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and now you can go up there and tell him I, I tell you, shut the fuck up. Okay, and I'm not gonna retract that. I'm not gonna apologize for any fucking thing I do in here now. Okay. Well, Mister, excuse me. Don't don't shit. Next time when you speak, please do not look at me because I'm just over here. When you speak, look at me. Listen. Don't start it. Excuse me. Don't start something. He said, "Don't look at me." You know. So, head pressure controls maintain desired pressures. Standard efficiency condenser. Now, um, standard efficiency compressors, thirty degrees is the normal split, but um, that's for like, oh, so the older right? ones. No, 30 degree yeah, split, right. standard efficiency, something that takes you in the region of tens here. Yeah. Okay. All right? But the thing is, when you get into refrigeration system per se, that 30 degrees, this is applied to uh, air condition. Yeah. I may see 25 degrees for the same standard efficiency system. Because remember, the lower the temperature we try to achieve, the less energy we are removing. So the less energy we remove, the less heat we have to reject. So our split out there now will be kind of low, narrow. So it may be 20 degrees, 15, yes sir. Repeat that again. The lower the temperature we try to achieve or go to, mm -hmm. the less heat we have to reject in a given time. So we do not need to overwork our compressor and bring it up to that. No. You can see 20 degrees, and some of these systems work as low as uh, 10 degrees, depends on ambient. Now, if ambient temperature goes down to, 
that split will go down because you do not, remember now, I have colder ambient, so I have, the air has more uh, ability to accept that ton load of heat energy I'm throwing at it. Can accept more in a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And so all, all of those are factors which will actually determine what your split will be. But to be on the safe side, whenever you're charging these, always check the amperage draw of your, comp your compressor. It should not exceed RLA as listed by the manufacturer. As you charge. Uh, as you charge. All right? As you charge. Because the thing is, as soon as you hit RLA, and this, even if this is showing you 20 degrees, hey, stop that charging because you're more or less loaded, your, your compressor is loaded fully. Now, if you feel you're on the charge, but my compressor is loaded fully, something is wrong someplace. You have to address that. Okay, so we thinking, um, give me that problem with compressor drawing full load amps and, and not showing the split I need to get to. 30 kid that's a 30 evaporator. Of course, the head pressure goes up. It all points to a kind of a partial restriction on the high side. I don't see restriction of not enough. On the high side. The head pressure would go up. Because you're looking at the high side split. Yeah, like I said, you're not getting um, you're getting full amperage, but not enough to be refrigerant. So you will probably have to uh, remember, if I'm not getting enough refrigerant, my split will be low because I'm not pulling out enough heat from the evaporator to transfer it out there. So my split will be low anyhow. So those are things you have to address as you go along. And it happens a lot with old system because the thing is, restaurant owners, they're the last people who want to spend money on their refrigeration system. See, they prefer go and pay the health department $850 fine than to change something in one of these systems that may cost $300. Okay. But then they don't want to change this. They will go pay that fine and then they call you to change the same thing you wanted to change it. So they end up paying double, double, triple. Double, triple. Double, triple. Is there such a thing? Yeah. Triple, double. Yeah. So, you know, it's like they they kind of be dumb to see what kind of funeral they got. And they, that's the funeral they get anyhow. They have to pay a ton of money. And you know, the, the thing is, when they go up to the judge, they don't argue. But with me, who's trying to fix this stuff, they're gonna argue. They want to cut price here, they want, you know? So. So, common system problem, overcharge, or you could be undercharge, restriction, inefficient compressor, or condenser, or evaporator. But this overcharge here, two things can happen that would behave as if that system is overcharged. One is what? One can actually be overcharged, right? One, be and the other one mimics overcharge as well. No, the other condition that will mimic this system being overcharged. Water flow. Uh, dead uh, uh, expansion valve, mm -hmm. maybe flooding, you know, broken expansion valve. How about that? Restriction? Yes. If I'm restricted by the filter dryer. All my refrigerant backs up in my condenser coil. It behaves as if it's overcharged, right? Because the pressure will be high, subcooling will be rare. Now we gotta go through this with subcooling and on the charge, or with a restriction. And you'll see something when we come back from break. Okay. So grab your break. Are they open there? Yes, I know.